Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with RSU TV at Rogers State University in Oklahoma. Today we are chatting with Donna Grabo, Executive Director of SafeNet Services, who has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Donna, for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you for uh, asking me, too. That's kind of neat. Well, SafeNet is such an interesting organization. It has such an important, important role. You're a founding director. Talk about what SafeNet is. Well, SafeNet is actually for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. And, but we do a compass all of it because domestic violence is generational. It keeps marching on from to the kids because they learn it and go on. And so we have, of course, we have the shelter so that women and children can come into shelter. And if we have male victims, then we will put them in a motel for short term and, and still work with them. But then we have counseling, whether you're in shelter or if it has happened to you and you're in your own home and you're or, or there's something with sexual assault, maybe you were raped years ago and now something triggers you, we have outreach counseling for them that's free. And then we have a counselor that's dedicated to children. And then we also have batter's intervention because we found out after we had started it, we helped one get out. And then when he got the next girlfriend about five months later, then she's in shelter. And so we decided we're not helping the whole thing if we don't help batters change their ways. And so we have four classes of batters intervention. 30 years ago, when you, when you founded this organization, 29 years ago when you founded this organization, what was the circumstance that led you to this very dramatic gesture? Well, actually I was working in early childhood and then it was um, Clayton Rogers, who is a counselor um, here in, in Claremore and was on a board and they had uh, started, got, was thinking about doing a shelter and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he called me and he said, I think you could handle this. And went just in, in, in that time in Minnesota, they just had their addresses for their shelters in the phone book. Right. And so I happened to pick, they had several shelters, I happened to pick the Margaret Tugman shelter. And I went to visit the, the lady and she gave me all kinds of ideas and it was wonderful on how they were very trauma-informed care at the beginning. And I got forms, and so I came back and thought, the reason, I, and I started reading uh, Lenore Walker's book about abuse, and I decided that, you know, we don't, we should not stay together for the kids when it's a domestic violence right. situation. Because victims need to get out with the children so that the children aren't learning that pattern. Well, that's also the thing, right? It, th this whole idea of staying together for the for the children, yeah. mm -hmm. the staying together for the children perpetuates a number of different uh, mm -hmm. issues, right. right? Right, and they lead. So a lot of the men today that were uh, that are abusing today were abused as children or in abusive homes. Because they encode that behavior yeah. mm -hmm. as being that's the way one right. behaves. Right, right. So, so those families that stay together and they have teenage boys, pretty soon the boys are also doing the same thing towards the mother. Right. So now she has, they have like a network of abusers to her, so it's even harder to get out. Right. And, and also there's some of the children that as they get older, they try to defend the mother, then they get in trouble. Right and then they're in the, in the juvenile system. So you started with a facility. Right. You yeah, started there's... with, because safety, the initial piece mm -hmm. is just create, create that refuge. Right, and, and we didn't let our addresses out at that time. Right. You know, that we, we kept it all secret. So, and probably with good order because the only thing we had for safety was a deadbolt on the door. We didn't have the cameras all around. We didn't have the computers, that kind of thing. But since then, about in, around 2005, um, we really believed that domestic violence is a crime. And, um, and so we worked with um, Drew Edmondson, who was the attorney general at the time. And he can really talk the talk and walk the talk, let me tell you. He's just wonderful at figuring out all of this. And so we were able to move from that department, State Department, so we are under the Victim Services Unit of the Attorney General's Office, which then gave, I think, a little more credence to it, mm -hmm. you know, so that this is a combination with your first responders, your law enforcement, with getting them to safety, you know, working with the criminal justice system, 
in the courts with the protective orders and trying to put the whole package together to keep victims safe and offenders accountable. Um, so you have the intervention, the physical safety, right? Right. Very often you have children involved. Oh yes. Um, and then you start to have services that wrap around uh, this person who is who has been abused. Right. So describe those services that that are provided. So like when someone comes in, you mm -hmm. know, there's they may have been to the hospital already due right. to the incident, so they've already seen quite a few people. I mean, it involves, like you say, more than just mm -hmm. coming to shelter. And so then if they're going to file a protective order, it's going to the courthouse, getting that done. Do you provide them with help on that? Yes, we have. Here in Rogers County, we have the protective order office, the county mm -hmm. commissioners. Mm -hmm give that and our um, court advocates staff that and help every day filing protective orders. Now let's say there's a protective order. Mm -hmm. In place. Then, then the, the person, but that's not where your services end. No, because once that's done, then they have to be transported back and forth from shelter to make sure that they're free. Once they have the counseling, we have the healing relationships classes that they can go to. We have, you know, sexual assault, advocacy. Um, so the various uh, classes that allow uh, victims to process yes. uh, these uh, people who've experienced this kind mm -hmm. of abuse, to process them and begin that road from victim to empowered person. Right, to a survivor. We to a survivor. Or, and then to a thriver. That path mm -hmm. from being a survivor to being a thriver and that's, that's, the, that, that's the shift. It's the shift right. in a power dynamic that you have in yourself. Right. And see, so many when they first come in, if they're bruised all over, then it takes six to eight weeks before you can actually go look for work. Right. And a lot of times, you're because of that intimidation and everything, you've lost your self-esteem. Right. And when that happens, you don't make wise decisions. And at that's all. the sense. That's the sense. I know that the that the politically correct um, term is not is not victim, but really? that in that in that is. place <laughs> in that place, sometimes people are so down right and mm -hmm. and to get to the point where they are a survivor where they're where they're affirmatively thinking about their fortitude and their toughness that they've gone through this process and then build on that to right. the next stage right uh, that's really what your program is right. is helping to do yeah helping them with hope again instead of being hopeless right is the main thing in terms so. of your staff you have uh, 14 full-time staff you have 26 uh, part-time staff. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a lot of volunteers. Right. Uh, talk about uh, the staff experience and and uh, have have uh, many of your staff experienced this type of? Uh, we have several survivors at our staff. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but several are. And I think you know the part of being a survivor and then working in this field, you have to be a survivor for a long time right. because when you hear it every day, it starts to re-traumatize you. Right. So you have to really be past your own because you have to be, and what we always say, all of us have to stay mentally healthy. Even though you have troubles at home as a staff member, I do have to learn to leave that at home and come to my work right. fresh because if we bring in or if we have strife, it's just like parents, if you mm -hmm. have strife, then the kids pick up on that. Well, if we do it, then our residents in right. our shelter pick up on that. Do you help uh, your staff and your volunteers process the trauma that they experience? Because it's inevitable. I mean, you right. you you are in a war zone. There will be these situations, right. and you will be serving. Well, and one thing is to really celebrate the one or two That's right. starfish that go back in the sea and live. Right. And so by doing that, that helps you realize it's not that you have to get 100%. Right. It's that you make a difference to this person and that's what counts. And then how do you take care of yourself? Each of us has to know how we handle stress. How, what do you have to do, do you ha you know, to get rid of that? Um, and so we'll do, we have different speakers in for vicarious trauma and we have monthly staff meetings and we celebrate each other as to what, what has happened and what, how, what the successes have been. You've been in this business for long enough with this organization mm -hmm. for long enough to get a perspective on long-term trends. Do you feel that that a society here is healing, is getting better? Is it dealing with these issues? Or is this, are, are we just able to do what little good we can 
but it's, it's continuing. Well, we're not doing enough in prevention. So we do have one, um, it's called the uh, Rape Prevention Education Grant. And so we have a SEM specialist now. Cassie goes out to the schools and works on healthy relationships like safety and teaches the safe dates curriculum. Mm -hmm. She's also now the only one in the state that has been trained in the bystander. So talk about, talk about what that actually means. What that means is you're learning what a healthy relationship is. Right. And once you learn what it is, then you know, well, no, we're not on that scale. We don't fit on that scale. And safe dates is in part about boundaries? Yes, right. You don't have to act on every... You don't have to do it. Right. You don't have to take that as an, an abrasive to you all the time right. for, and verbal abuse and stuff like that. Or it's, or it's saying, I don't, I don't touch me, or I, right. I do not like touches. It's being able to express your opinion without someone calling off and hitting you. Right. For that right. opinion. Um, so it is, the, it is showing respect for each other and, and an equal, being equal. What's next for the organization over well, the next years? Well, we're in the crossroads, I think. There's a lot we need to build in, uh, a new office in prior because um, we're no longer in leftover buildings we, now that we have the uh, Donald W. Reynolds Family Safety Center that, we, mm -hmm. that grant we worked on for seven years. And now we've been in that building seven years. And I'm getting up in age, so I'm, I will be retiring in uh, right around June of 2020. And so that's a, so our board of directors is working on that and the succession plan. And so, you know, this spring is when we'll be letting it out and they'll be interviewing for a new executive director. And that's a, that's a huge task because of how long I've been here right. and your staff and you, and the thing is, you know, you didn't work time and a half and you work, put your life in, blood into this right. for it to fail. Right. And, and it never ends with what else you need to do. Right. I always have said, this whole program is like holding an octopus in the tentacles. There's always a tentacle out somewhere. But you just have to be flexible. You have to keep have that vision. You have to keep moving forward with it and knowing that you have made a difference in people's lives and you can continue to make a difference. So important, so yeah. important, and this is a never-ending problem. We need to talk about it. Yeah. Yes. We need to deal with it. We need to invest in these uh, women. We need to make our society safer for all. Donna Grabo, thank you so much for sharing thank the work you, of SafeNet Services, and thank you so much for I, your insights. I appreciate all, you very much. Well, I appreciate thank you, you so much. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you.